Hello, everyone. Um, today, um, Jamie's very kindly invited me to talk about EmberKit, which is uh, the first product that I've made since I quit my job about two months ago. Um, so I was working full time for about five years for Macmillan, big publishing company um, over in King's Cross, and I finally decided it was time to go do my own thing again. Um, so basically, uh, this comes with a bit of a warning. Uh, this is a bit of an advertorial, and I, I didn't actually propose this talk. Jamie did invite me to come along, so I, I kind of um, don't want to make it too spammy. Um, Ember Kit is a, a paid product, but um, hopefully I can give some information that's actually useful and talk about some of the technical stuff um, as well that will actually um, be useful. So the reason I decided to do this as my first product is that um, I have a bit of a problem getting stuff done. I always have loads of side projects and I've got maybe five like apps that are uh, where I've made kind of the main feature. So like I made a chat app that was supposed to integrate with IRC and GitHub and, and be really cool. And I made, you know, I made the chat, I made a, a nice IRC server with all the cool async stuff. And then, you know, it came to the time to actually like put it live and do all of the um, account management and billing and you know deployment and all that kind of stuff and I kind of just kind of got bored and decided I'd work on something else instead um, then you know I've you know it's kind of happened uh, a few times so when I decided I was going to do this full time I decided you know I can't that's not really practical like I'm just gonna go bankrupt if I do that um, so I decided you know I thought is there another way to do this and I kind of thought maybe if I could finish an app before I started it it would be kind of different and that obviously sounds kind of stupid. What I mean by that is I wanted to try and do all of the boring stuff that I normally get stuck on first um, and then only after that move on to doing the, the features of the app that are actually unique. So that's when I came up with the idea of, um, of EmberKit. What I wanted to do was do all the boring stuff first make it really smooth and polished. I set a goal of being able to launch it as a product that I would sell um, within a month so that um, you know I had a goal, I had a, a finishing point, and then I could move on and hopefully um, make some money from Emberkit whilst I was working on my new products. So I'm gonna give a quick demo. Uh, So this, let me zoom in a bit. This is Tompster Kit. When um, EmberKit comes with three branches, it's got a JavaScript branch, a CoffeeScript branch, and a Tompster Kit branch. And Tompster Kit is basically um, like a, a, a stupid demo. It has like one commit showing you what you would need to do to take, um, to add, you know, your apps feature um, to it. So what does it give you? It gives you sign up. Let's sign up for an account. Um, so you sign up for an account and um, you can then create an organization. So I guess let's call it, name it after our host. And then, you know, you've got your basic um, edit details, inviting users. Um, let's invite a user. You can choose a role of user or admin, invite them along. They will get an email with a link to join the site. Whoops, what's going on there? Oh, I've changed the port because I'm running it on a different port. Um, so you can join and sign up. There we go, and you can, if you're an admin, you can subscribe. Um, so there are subscription plans, 
Um, there, it uses Stripe at the moment. Um, something's broken. What have I broken? I've probably broken the Stripe integration. Oh, yes, I've broken the Stripe integration because I'm not on the Wi-Fi. So if I was on the Wi-Fi, if you had an internet connection, you could, I'd show you the um, Stripe, Stripe subscriptions, but it's all pretty basic monthly plans um, with limits. So let's go back to the presentation. Um, okay, so, I mean, that's kind of the basic. If you're building a very specific type of app, if you're building as a, a, a monthly build software, uh, monthly build software as a service app, um, this is probably going to save you a lot of time, and that's kind of the app I decided I want to build. I want to build uh, something that's like a monthly subscribed service that uh, brings in some recurring revenue. So I kind of built it so that I could use it, and hopefully it will be useful for other people too. Um, so now I'm going to talk about some of the... Um, the tech stuff that's that's gone into it and, and what it's kind of doing. So what I decided I wanted to do for EmberKit is have a full login and log out functionality within the application. It's really easy to on log out just refresh the whole page and that solves a lot of problems. Um, like I've done apps before where you don't get served the Ember app at all until you log in and login is actually handled by a Rails app or whatever. Um, and that makes things a lot easier, but I really wanted to deal with, you know, the whole thing being a single page application. You know, if you're a single page application, you should be a single page application. Um, and cross-site request forgery has been one of the harder things to do there. Um, you have to, you know, the, the basics of um, setting a cross-site request forgery token in a pre-filter is, um, is relatively simple, um, but one of the more complex elements of that is what happens if you have two tabs open. Um, initially what would happen is that in the first tab you click log out and you would be logged out. And because the token is dependent on the current session, the other app would still think it was logged in and would just start silently erroring every time it tried to make a request. So one of the things that you can do is to render a specific um, error message from the API when you detect an invalid token. Um, in this case, I've just rendered that string invalid CSRF token. Um, and then you reset the whole session and request a new token from the server. Um, so this is kind of showing that as well. Um, you, um, uh, in setup controller, you get from the actual session object, um, you, uh, you request the new token, and then you set it in, in the app and re reset logout calls reset session, which again resets the token. Um, there is actually this link should have probably been on the previous page, but there is a blog um, by um, Ye Mukund who uh, I was talking to on IRC which kind of describes this um, this type of session approach more um, in depth. Um, one of the other things that I really wanted to do with Ember Kit was kind of use Ember data as much as possible. Um, like I kind of treat it as a perverse challenge to not use any $.ajax calls at all and do everything restfully. Um, and that's kind of led, so a session is a virtual object on the server, but it's actually an Ember data model. It has an email and password attribute for logging in and it carries the token. Um, and you can, so this is an, on the left hand side, you can see the session object. It's just a plain old Ruby object with some includes in it. Um, and then you have an active model serializer which serializes that that session and that's kind of the approach i've taken for um some of the other areas of the app which are again oops which are again um plain ember data models so a password recovery you create a password uh, recovery request with your email address and post to it and then it will send you a um a, a link in an email and that will allow you to create a password request um, a password reset request which will reset your password. So it's been quite interesting to see how far you can push it just, you know, using REST. It kind of requires some thinking restfully and contorting about resource naming and resources, but it's been kind of fun. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about um, testing. So the reason I'm showing this slide is because I use Cucumber and Cucumber is kind of a love-hate thing, like lots of people really hate it um, and I really love it. Um, <laughs> it's um, the great thing I, I think about Cucumber is that it lets you test in a really abstract way um, and I think that a lot of 
organizations abuse it like I've really seen at the, my previous job I've seen it really abused to you do unit tests effectively and cucumber is really slow for doing unit tests like um, it's it's a really bad idea so if you if you keep it at a really high level it can really help um, the reason I kind of chose to use cucumber is I really wanted a full stack integration test I wanted to test everything from the front end to the database um, and in fact, the Cucumber test actually tests the live Stripe integration with the, well, the, sorry, the test API, but it actually, the, it actually talks to Stripe. And I kind of thought, if I'm selling a product that lets you bill customers, like, I really want to be sure that it's working. Like, I really want that to, to be solid. So I decided I'd start with this. Um, the tests run in about two minutes, and they would run in about 30 seconds if the Stripe test API wasn't so slow. So I'm working on stubbing that. Um, which is easy on the server side, but it's kind of harder to stub out client side calls to the Stripe checkout library, but I think I've got a way to do that. So that's going to come soon. Um, Emberkit also has three versions. It's got JavaScript, a CoffeeScript, and the Thomas to Kit kind of sample version I showed you. And Cucumber covers them all with exactly the same tests. Some of the step definitions might need to be slightly different in some cases, but it means that you can kind of write the test once and test it against multiple implementations. And seeing as I'm planning a Ember CLI implementation soon. Um, I thought it was really important to um, to kind of keep um, keep it flexible so that I could you know not have to write all my tests again when I want a new different implementation. Um, and Joe Joe who's here has a great um, slideshow about um, testing Ember apps, which kind of goes into the different options of full stack testing. And interestingly enough, one of the slides that Joe has at the very end of the, her her deck about um, you know what would be great would be driving integration tests, full stack integration tests from the browser. Um, I might actually be doing some work on that um, in the next couple of weeks and figuring out a nice approach for for driving full stack integration tests from the browser, which would, if you check out this presentation, shows you kind of like not driving them from the browser kind of creates like async dependencies that make things kind of hard and annoying and slow. Um, so after one month, I was really fortunate to be retweeted by a couple of members of the core team and got seen by loads of people. Um, made about 50 sales, mostly of the educational license. So there are three licenses. The educational license is uh, 39 bucks, and it lets you kind of you know, look at the code and see if it's, um, you know, hopefully learn something from it. There's a single site license, which lets you build a a site on it and a multi-site license for agencies and stuff. I've had a couple of sales of the single site and multi-site, but it's mostly been from uh, people who wanted to learn, which is um, quite good. Um, hopefully I've helped some people figure out some stuff. Um, but since in that month, I've actually used, um, I've actually started using it for my own project that I wanted to work on and also used big parts of it for a client project. So I think it's been a huge success really. It's kind of forced me to to kind of do the boring stuff for something that's going to let me build on stuff in future. And, you know, it's kind of paid for itself in a way. So um, I'm kind of really pleased with, um, with how it's gone. Um, so I'd like to finish off by offering a 50% off coupon to anyone who would like to use it and um, ask if there's any questions. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Yes? Your password request model. Yes. Just model.save. Someone comes along and loads up the Ember plugin in the browser. Are they not going to see your password? Uh, how do you it so it can't be read off? Yes. So that is um, a problem. Like what happens? So there, there is the app that I've been working on in the past couple of weeks uh, actually has a lot more models um, in it than Emberkit, which has obviously only got the, the stuff that's that you've seen. So um, I've been working on a way to reset the session when you log out um, and resetting the session, including deleting everything from the store. Um, and I've actually figured out that you can use app.reset for that. So that's the helper that's useful for testing. It will just give you a new container with new everything in it. Um, and that's something that I'm going to integrate into Emberkit soon, just basically blitzing out the whole store on logout or login. Um, and that will kind of mitigate that. Uh, ultimately, though, I think that, you know, 
MBKit isn't designed, and, and single page applications aren't designed to be secure against people looking in your console. And I think that, like, I, I wouldn't rely on it. I definitely wouldn't rely on it being secure against people, you know, who have access to your browser inspector. Um, that's just that's not a threat model that has been considered really, and it probably wouldn't be secure even if that particular case is catered for. Okay. Uh, yeah. Quick question. Just about the unit testing. You do a lot of unit testing. How do you spread back? You um, so at the moment, I haven't done. Uh, I've, uh, so all, everything on the Ruby side is tested in RSpec, um, but not on the client side with Ember testing. Um, that will come soon. I've been meaning to do some more of that. Ember's kind of hard to unit test. Like you can do some things, and you. I mean, it, it's supposedly easy, but like practically, it's hard. So you can. Because of the container, you can um, dependency injection. Like you can set up tests relatively easily and mock out the things that you want to mock out. But it just lends itself. I find myself just writing integration tests, um, whether not whether that's with Cucumber and doing the full stack, or even if I'm writing tests in JavaScript with QUnit. I just find myself writing integration tests in JavaScript that stub out the API. Um, I think that it would be good to do more unit testing and make that kind of a more natural thing. But at the moment, I found that that's something that I'm just, uh, I just find a bit hard. I do it for, I do it for certain things. Like if I've got like a complex, like recently I was working on a pagination component and you know, that actually turned out to be relatively complex because you want to show like a window around the current page and you don't want to show like a thousand pages. You want to show like one to five and then like 900 to 905 and then you want to show like the last five. Um, and I ended up unit testing that. But mostly everything's really lightweight in Ember and you know, you, it, there, there, isn't, there aren't really that many complex algorithms generally in what you're writing. It's normally like display data here. And that really lends itself to integration testing more than unit testing, I found. Yes. Um, so you mentioned a couple of things that are in the pipeline with the Stripe stuff in and the, um, the Ember CLI stuff. It, is it going to be something that you continue adding to over time? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is really. I mean, it's. I. I, I I guess until like I, I make my first successful product and go and retire on an island somewhere, <laughs> um, like I think I will always be updating this to be the thing that I, I build on. I build on, like I think it's it's kind of it was kind of quite important to me to build something that was what I needed to use, and trying to sell it is kind of a side effect for me. Like I, I wanted something, you know, that's kind of the goal I set myself so that I would actually do it <laughs> rather than, you know, the um, so I've released about, I, I think I'm version 1.0.3 now. Um, I've released a load of updates and um, I'm going to hopefully continue. And pulling in those changes, like if, if you start the project using this, I guess you just set it up as a, as a git. Uh, yeah, from, yeah, you can, you can pull them in via, uh, via git. So yeah, there's a, it's new, the, each version is, um, has a diff from the previous version, so you could pull it in. Um, it's not ideal. Like I, I mean, you you know you'll have some merge conflicts probably, um, and that's something that I don't know. I just don't know if, know if there's a really good solution for that practically. Like I don't know if there's a really good solution for that apart from like making everything modular and then like spending like six months making you know reusable modules for everything. Um, if that has its own problems. So yeah, if you like upgrades can be problematic, but hopefully they won't be too problematic. Depends on your app and what you change. Um, I mean, you know, if uh, because it comes with the big test suite, hopefully you'll have continued maintaining that test suite, and hopefully it will be relatively easy to find out if you've broken anything. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Well, thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>